Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on Confronting Stigma, the Impact of Substance Use on Organ Transplantation. Now, before we begin today's presentation, there are just a few logistical items that we'd like to review with you all. For optimal visual and audio experience, we do recommend accessing these webinars using the Chrome browser. So if you are currently using another browser and begin to encounter any issues, especially with audio, uh, please log back in using Chrome. If you do continue to experience those audio issues, please dial in using the phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. Now, for those of you who have never joined us on this webinar platform before, please take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat can be used to pose questions to our speakers. So if you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation is complete, we'll have some time for our presenters to address as many of your questions as time allows. Now, for those of you who may be interested in our upcoming webinars, registration is currently open for our next transplant webinar entitled Healthcare Transitions, Lessons from the Field. That's coming your way on June 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our upcoming Brain Death webinar, so please be sure to join us for that on July 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can register for all these webinars and more on our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for anyone that is seeking continuing education credits, please note we are offering one step fee credit and one nursing contact hour for this webinar. Everyone joining us today is entitled to claim these credits. So if you're listening in a group, as many of you are, please make sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. There's a very brief online evaluation which will allow you to receive your credit. As a reminder, for nursing, you have 14 days to claim your credit, and for SEPC, you have 30 calendar days. Now, as the moderator for today's webinar, I'd like, to, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Gerald Scott Winder and Dr. Carl Christensen. Dr. Scott Winder is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Surgery at the University of Michigan. He holds a medical degree from the University of Utah School of Medicine and a Master's of Science degree in Clinical Research Design and Statistical Analysis from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He completed a general psychiatry residency and a consultation liaison psychiatry fellowship at the University of Michigan. As a consultation liaison psychiatrist, Dr. Winder specializes in the psychiatric care of the medically ill. In this clinical niche, he has co-founded specialty clinics embedded in organ transplantation neurology, and hepatology, where he works on multidisciplinary teams providing integrated psychiatric and medical care to patients whose diseases cross medical disciplines. His particular clinical and academic passions are psychiatric disorders and liver disease patients. We are also joined by Dr. Christensen, who obtained his MD and a PhD in biochemistry at Wayne State University School of Medicine and completed his res residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Hudson Hospital. He then completed a fellowship in gynecologic oncology at Duke University Medical Center in 1988. He returned to Wayne State practicing both obstetrics and gynecology and gynecologic oncology and was an associate residency director of the OBGYN residency until 2012. He continues as a clinical associate professor in the department. While working with the late Dr. James Wardell, one of, his, one of the first uh, obstetricians to treat pregnant addicted women, he became certified in addiction medicine in 2004 and later board certified in addiction medicine in 2009. Uh, he is the current medical director for Dawn Farm and as mentioned, serves as a clinical associate professor for the departments of obstetric and gynecology at Wayne State University of School, School of Medicine. He has received numerous teaching awards and has been named one of the top docs in addiction medicine in our magazine for 2006 through 2013. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, Dr. Christensen and Dr. Winder. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Christensen, to get us started with today's program. Okay. Thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, my name is Carl Christensen. I'm an addiction medicine specialist in Detroit and Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I have no financial relationships to disclose. And I'm going to be talking about the nuts and bolts of treatment. And the first thing to go over is what level of treatment are we talking about? The lowest bar that is used is called harm reduction. And for us, we would consider that to be uh, things like needle exchange programs to reduce HIV and hepatitis C, but not to treat the actual uh, drug abuse. And that's something that 
we won't be talking about today. The next level is abstinence, which in this case means abstinence from opioids, not necessarily all drugs, and that will usually involve with opioids some type of medication-assisted therapy. And then you have full recovery, which also implies a return to society and a full functional life, and that may or may not involve medication-assisted therapy. So the problem is that in most cases when we try and treat opioid dependence, the most likely outcome is relapse, and we try, we try and figure out why that happens. And this is research that's done by Dr. Mark Gold down in Florida, and he first took three volunteers and did brain scans of their metabolism of their cortex, and the frontal cortex is up at the top, and that red and yellow is what your brain is supposed to look like if it's functioning. He then took three volunteers who were active cocaine addicts and hospitalized them and monitored them for drug use. And this is their brain scan 10 days uh, after they stopped using cocaine. And the description brain dead would not be too far from the truth. You can see there's really no metabolic activity going on. And unfortunately, even 100 days later, uh, if you compare the top row and the bottom row, there's a huge difference in the amount of activity going on in the brain. And this is when, by the way, if you were a recovering surgeon, if you were an active cocaine addict and in recovery and in our monitoring program in Michigan, this is when you would go back to doing surgery. So obviously there's still some damage here, and it actually takes about a year and a half or more to recover from the damage. And during that time, you're at risk for relapse because you have poor impulse control and very poor judgment. And as far as treating addiction, uh, one way is abstinence. We're going to talk about a couple examples of that. And then you have counseling, which is most often used with alcohol dependence and is found to be very successful with alcohol dependence. And then you have medication-assisted therapy, which is used primarily for opiate dependence, which is what we're focusing on today. And there are two major groups in medication-assisted therapy, or MAT. There is agonists, which are similar to the drug you're trying to stop using, and then antagonists, which have the opposite effect. Agonists are methadone and buprenorphine in the U.S., and antagonists, there is only one, naltrexone, and the only one that is really used clinically very much is the Vivitrol injection, which is given every four weeks. And as far as methadone goes, there's a huge stigma about methadone and methadone clinics, but it's hard to argue with the results in terms of um, improvement in quality of life and function. There's a decrease in all these things here, mortality, IV drug use, crime, HIV, hepatitis C, relapse onto IV drug use, and health and employment. And this is all uh, discussed in a study by Dr. John Ball in 1988 that's referenced here in another study at the bottom. And this was Dr. Ball's study. He took multiple methadone clinics during the uh, beginning of the HIV crisis, and he found that over a five-year period, there was a 70% reduction in IV drug use, which is huge. Now, these patients are not in recovery. They're not necessarily abstinent, but they're not doing IV injection which is the most dangerous thing. However, the bad news is that, remember I showed you those pictures of impaired brains, and these same patients would decide that they were cured and no longer had a, a problem. Uh, and you can see that over a period of 12 months, uh, the relapse rate back onto IV drug use has, is 80% at least. So when you stop using this medication, it stops working. The next medication is buprenorphine. We all call it Suboxone or Subutex or Zebsolve. It's a partial agonist, which means it is not as strong as methadone or even heroin, but it is much, much safer, and it relieves withdrawal and craving. There are very, very few deaths with buprenorphine unless you mix it with a sedative or with alcohol. There are thousands of deaths every year from methadone, so it is much safer in terms of causing respiratory depression, but it's not as potent. And this is just a study from a real-life buprenorphine program on the East Coast. And what you can see is that at two years, 40% are still in treatment, 
And it turns out also that 90% of these patients are negative for opioids, and there's a very high satisfaction score. And if you look at the Cochrane database review, methadone versus buprenorphine, methadone is considered to be more effective because it's more potent, but buprenorphine overall has a better safety profile. Drug number three is going to be the naltrexone injection. And this study actually took place in Russia. And this is an actual treatment center in Russia uh, where MAT is not allowed. And what they do is they handcuff you to a cot and you go through withdrawal for two weeks. And that consists of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, and that's why the gentleman on the bottom bunk looks so nervous. And then at the end of the two weeks, they uncuff you and the natural history of this is that you use as soon as you get out of the treatment center. The relapse rate is essentially 100%. So they did this study in Russia, and it was a double-blind, randomized, controlled trial of Vivitrol injections versus placebo injections and also with um, extra additional housing, counseling, and treatment. And you can see that the Vivitrol group at six months was superior to the placebo group. And most of the difference you see here is actually placebo effect, but there is a significant difference between placebo and Vivitrol. So it was approved by the FDA for treatment of opioid dependence. And one surprise was that even though this is a complete opioid blocker so that you can't get any euphoria, patients who used it experienced a 50% decrease in craving score. And craving... Um, is one of the main causes of relapse. It probably is the main cause of relapse because these patients were far past withdrawal. Now, the other problem is that nobody wants to stay on medication-assisted therapy. There's too much stigma, and every patient I have had has asked me on the first day I started them on medication when they can stop the medication. So let's review how successful that normally is. This is from Dr. Jason Ludi in England. He found 101 opiate-dependent pregnant women and managed to completely detox 40, which is an outstanding result. And they were allowed to go on their way, and this, this paper was touted as the answer to uh, pregnancy and opioid dependence, saying you don't need methadone anymore. However, when you look at the fine print of the patients that were monitored, only one patient was found to have a negative drug screen. Everybody else had disappeared or had relapsed. And that's really the natural history of addiction is going to be relapse. This is uh, another, oops, we're going to skip this one. This is another study from Sweden. This is the most famous uh, detox study on buprenorphine. They took 40 active heroin addicts. Everybody was given buprenorphine. Half the patients were allowed to taper off, which is what all my patients want to do, and half agreed to stay on the medication and they followed them for a year. And a year later, here are the patients that stayed on buprenorphine. 75% were abstinent and nobody died. In the group that tapered off buprenorphine, nobody was abstinent and 20% de were dead. Again, detox um, and coming off this medication abruptly in this case was a complete failure. And this is the biggest study done on tapering off buprenorphine. It's a very painful study to uh, go through, but basically they took 654 opiate-dependent patients. Most were addicted to prescription pills. Some were addicted to heroin, and many of these patients had a, quote, chronic pain, unquote, diagnosis. And they put them on buprenorphine and tapered them off rapidly after a couple weeks, and then put them back on buprenorphine and tapered them off again. And here was their findings. Um, about 50% of the patients who took buprenorphine stopped using opioids. So it's about 50% effective. And patients who had chronic pain were still as successful, so this medication actually probably treated their pain as well. However, those who were heroin users did not do as well. It was more like 15% for them, so this was a poor prognostic factor. And the bad news is, in two separate attempts of coming off buprenorphine, the relapse rate was over 90% both times. And this was actually has been confirmed in other studies uh, that this medication is effective. However, when you come off this medication, 
uh, you no longer are able to remain abstinent. And I have on here that uh, I've been disconnected from the program. Dr. Winder, uh, Dr. Christensen, are you still on the line? I'm on the line, but I was cut, I was disconnected. Uh, do you want to go to Dr. Winder and then come back to me, or let me see if I can get back on? We can forward the slides for you if you have. Yeah, if you're um, able to okay. at least see the slides, I can advance them on your behalf. Yep. So. Um, Next slide is uh, relapse after Vivitrol. This is Dr. Lee in 2017. And uh, this was a program offered to prisoners who re-entered society and were put on uh, Vivitrol injections. And this slide actually appears the same as a slide from Russia. The Vivitrol was more effective than placebo uh, at suppressing opioid use. However, on the next slide, what they found was that opioid use prevention effects essentially disappeared after discontinuation, which is a way of saying that once the medication was stopped, everybody relapsed. And the next slide uh, talks about conclusions for MAT, for opioid dependence. It's about 50% effective. And following that slide, uh, stopping MAT will almost always cause relapse and increased chance of death. And we really shouldn't expect anything else because we're not curing patients. We are uh, simply providing them for treatment, which if you stop the treatment, the effect disappears. And buprenorphine, methadone, and Vivitrol in the next two slides are all effective at reducing opioid use. And the next three slides talk about if these medications can be used in patients who have impaired liver function, and this was taken from a recent review of uh, up to date, and uh, they classified them as mild, moderate, and severe based on child's classification. And with buprenorphine, the only concern is if somebody has severe impairment or child's class C, the dose should be reduced by 50%. We don't have any serum levels that we can normally draw. The next slide looks at impaired hepatic function with methadone. And methadone is the, probably the best drug to use in someone with severe liver disease because uh, other organs will metabolize it. And you can also get serum levels of metabolites and parent compound and monitor the serum levels, which you can't do with buprenorphine. However, the next slide talking about naltrexone uh, shows that uh, with severe impairment, there is a dramatic increase in the serum concentration of uh, naltrexone, and you should probably not use naltrexone or use a markedly decreased dose, at least, in somebody who has uh, impaired liver function, severely impaired. The next slide is talking about abstinence-based programs uh, similar to AA, and is there any role for these in the patients that we're treating uh, for possibility of liver transplant? And the following program, I'm sorry, the following slide talks about safety-sensitive professions, which involves pilots, lawyers, law enforcement, and healthcare professionals. Um, and every state in the country, including Michigan, has a physician monitoring program for impaired physicians, and we also have one for impaired pilots. And the five-year success rate is 85%, which is confirmed at 10 years. This is much more successful than the other programs that I've been talking about to date. We also have probation enforcement programs um, on the next slide, referring to the Hawaii Opportunity for Probation Enforcement, which has similar success rates. And the next slide talks about drug courts, which are very heterogeneous in the U.S., and the outcome obviously depends on what drug is involved and racial disparities. But the overall success rate of drug courts is also about 50% or higher. And many of these are now accepting MAT, so that may change the numbers. And on the next slide, um, these programs use a combination of what's called negative reinforcement, 
and leverage, which essentially is that there will be a consequence to using. Next slide uh, acknowledges that these licensees are treated as if they have a chronic medical illness and not a short-term problem. And the success rates for the high-intensity programs we've talked about is 80% on the next slide. And the following slide again acknowledges that MAT is now being used by these programs and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And the following two slides are specific to our transplant patients. And the first one is should abstinence from illicit drugs be required for trans transplantation? And this is something that I've been exposed to in the uh, transplant hospitals down here in Detroit where we were told that our patients needed to uh, be clean, quote unquote, for six months up to a year before they would be a candidate for transplant. And if you look at the literature that I could find, these uh, predictive papers or review papers dealt primarily with liver transplantation for alcoholism, which is not as lethal or likely to be lethal quickly as opioid dependence. And they also found that if patients relapsed onto alcohol after transplantation, that the risk of death uh, was prolonged and, and relatively low. So they didn't advocate requiring uh, a waiting list or a waiting time. However, the following slide uh, talks about, uh, I'm sorry, the following slide talks about opioid dependence and the major risk that we are seeing now is fentanyl. In Detroit, the majority of heroin samples don't have heroin anymore, they are simply fentanyl. And that makes this much more dangerous and it's possible that making people wait to document their abstinence if they become frustrated and relapse may result in death. However, on the next slide, this is a complete conjecture, but requiring abstinence before transplantation may allow the leverage of getting someone engaged in other treatments, for example, um, treating their hepatitis C uh, before they are eligible for transplant. And again, I don't know of any data to support one argument or the other. However, the next slide talks about um, should transplant programs require that patients come off their medication-assisted therapy, and I've been exposed to this also where I've been told uh, that uh, our patient had to come off methadone or come off Suboxone before they could get a transplant, and we know that MAT is about 50% successful in reducing mortality. That's a huge number. We also know that when people stop their MAT, they relapse. And we know that once they relapse after coming off their MAT, they're at increased risk of overdose and death. And the abstinence-based programs that I was just touting are very promising, but they're very expensive, they're very labor-intensive, and they are not common programs. So the answer to this slide and the next slide is no, we should not be requiring patients to come off their MAT. And that's it for my slide. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. I, like Dr. Christensen, don't have any um, conflicts of interest or financial disclosures. Uh, Dr. Christensen's summary uh, concentrated on opioids, and appropriately so, given the present state of affairs and the fact that our transplant patients are medicalized in terms of how they interface with the health system and the fact that they will experience post-operative pain and will require um, opiate medications. I've actually, um, I'm going to broaden our view a little bit and take on some of the more nuts and bolts about substance use disorders and how they intersect with transplant. I will also um, talk about other substances to kind of complement what Dr. Christensen has shared. I think it's important um, as a, a medical audience and medical profession that we understand that we are dealing with human beings and the reason that people use uh, substances is in large part about emotions. It, it involves um, very human parts of us that may not appear uh, naturally in transplant, and we have to remember that. Um, the distinction in medicine between um, what is medical and what is psychological is an unfortunate and archaic cultural inheritance. It's still present everywhere, and it, it, it's attributed back to 
the French philosopher René Descartes, and it's, um, it's persistent in medicine and society, but it is ignorant to the fact that brain, mind, body are all connected, and it's impossible to distinguish between them. And the people that we are transplanting are that. They are people and not angels. And sometimes the parts of their lives that bring them to substance use are hard to look at, hard to understand, uh, but they are the reality, and we, we've got to remember that. And stigma is an important part of this. Um, uh, it's something we can't avoid within ourselves or within our profession. Defined, it, stigma is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person, or another definition, a mark of shame or discredit or some sort of stain. And I think we're all vulnerable to this, and I think it's important when we interface with our substance use disorder patients that we acknowledge this. Um, there are a lot of uh, scarlet letters, and of course we all remember this uh, book where the A for Hester Prynne and Hawthorne's scarlet letter was of course for adultery, but there are other scarlet letter A's like alcoholic, addict, and substance abuser, and these are other ways that we brand people uh, with labels that are less helpful and potentially damaging. What do we mean when we say a substance use disorder? Well, substance use disorders are characterized by losing control of our relationship to a, person, uh, a particular substance, and we incur significant psychosocial consequences. We, there's significant loss of function. We become physiologically attached uh, to the medicine in, in a very uh, visceral and physical way. There are chronic brain changes that change you know, how our brain experiences rewards and emotion, how we make decisions, how we think, and how we behave. There's lots of etiologies to this, from genetics to how we were raised to what you know, uh, conditions we were raised in. And to the degree that we see this solely as a choice and solely as a moral failing, uh, we are uh, vulnerable to stigma. Um, DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the quote-unquote Bible of psychiatry, which is essentially just a list of criteria to kind of sort people into buckets as to what they're challenged with on an emotional level, given the fact that biomarkers and other physical and tactile ways to diagnose mental illness and, and addiction are very elusive. I won't read all that to you, but you can see the different types of measurements and criteria that we use, and DSM-4 to DSM-5 changed a little bit in that um, we no longer say, you know, substance dependence or substance abuse. We call it all a spectrum of substance use disorder, but then we categorize its severity based on how many symptoms they have and then we can designate some remission depending on if patients can abstain and for what time period. Um, so this, um, this slide is, is by Dr. Neuberger, who I actually uh, quoted earlier. And uh, what this was was a survey, uh, 1,000 members of the public, 200 family doctors, and 100 gastroenterologists. And they were given eight cases, and those appear here. And there are different aspects that the survey authors were querying. And you, so what this means right here in these three columns is higher numbers means that patients are more deserving, according to the public, the GPs, as well as the gastroenterologists. And you can kind of see that the prisoners are the lowest, but you also see that the people who, you know, the 45-year-old with alcoholic hepatitis, as well as the 45-year-old with hepatitis C from intravenous drug use, also are impacted in terms of how we view them. And then here, it's a little bit different. The higher scores mean that they are the least deserving, which kind of corroborates what we just said. Um, another uh, way to look at this, this was patients with primary biliary cirrhosis with and without a transplant. And this was interesting in that they looked at relatives, trans the transplant, um, transplanted patients, the patients themselves, prospective candidates, as well as friends. And so a higher... Um, higher score here means least deserving, and we kind of see this same thing. And I, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush and say this is strictly stigma, but I think everybody needs to sort of own, we all need to own, how we view these patients and what they come up against um, in, the, in the transplant uh, community. So how does this affect us? So apologize for the little font problem there. Um, there's a, a lot of tension between these two ideas. Of course, a dialectic just means that things that are contradictory can also both be true and seen as parts of a higher truth. For example, you know, I'm a very important person and I'm not very important. Both are true, just depends on how you're looking at the situation. And so for reductionism, 
you know, breaking people down into smaller and smaller and smaller parts, their genes, um, their organs, um, a particular lab value. But then you have holism, parts of medicine that try and synthesize and build people up, what people want, who they are as human beings, who they are in their broader social systems. There is a lot of tension between these two, and I think transplant is the quintessential example of how tense this can get. And I think we need to understand that it, we have to toggle between these lenses, especially when we view uh, uh, patients who struggle with addiction and substance use disorders. Um, my fonts are all a little bit different. I apologize for that, but it makes for more interesting on this end. Um, so I think that transplant providers are all amphibious, you know, and you know amphibians, you know, travel between water and land, and of course amphibious vehicles in the military can uh, go through water and of course are mobile on land as well. And I think this is what transplant, uh, we need to be, that we have to be able to think about the psychological, the psychiatric, and the substance use disorders right alongside of these uh, broader medical and surgical issues. And I think we all have our specialties and that's appropriate, but I think we need to acknowledge that the complexity of these patients really spurs us on uh, uh, to be more amphibious in terms of medical disciplines. Discussing this can be very, very difficult. Transplant teams um, are high stakes entities and there's lots of people with lots of opinions and what we're talking about is very subjective. It's stigmatized as we've talked about. We, we counter transference is just a psychoanalytic term that just means how a provider feels about a particular patient based on our own past experience. And so we all know that if we've, get, if we've gotten um, uh, burned before by a particular patient, the next patient who comes along, we're gonna feel differently about. These are highly emotional topics. We're uncertain what people are gonna do. It's very risky. And you know, I think Dr. Christensen's remarks are very, very important to, to, to discuss that part of this uh, equation. And of course, if we don't like the people we work with, we don't trust them and we don't think that they're helpful, well, this can also lead to a, a particular difficult um, discussion. So I think it's important to understand that uh, transplant really changes the patient-provider alliance. Transplant with the stakes of life and death will incentivize concealment. Substance use disorder patients are, at their core, prone to denial, prone to hiding. In fact, it's often just thought of as a symptom of the condition. Um, but when we transplant people, we form powerful emotional bonds with them. And so if a patient relapses, and keep in mind Dr. Christensen's statistics, especially with opioids, about how likely it is to relapse, well, the patient is, feels shameful, fearful, that they might be abandoned by the transplant team that's been so helpful and so important to their livelihood. To the team, if a patient relapses, they feel betrayed, angry, and detached, which both of these can have significant consequences. We know that patients who come in for transplant overall have a low desire for psychiatric treatment. I think clinically we understand that as psychiatrists, we are there in, as seen as some, uh, an obstacle to get through. It is very hard to form a robust clinical alliance, but it is possible, and I think we, we, we can do better in this, in this regard. As medical providers, if we implicitly or explicitly condone slips to alcohol or slips back to opioid use or tobacco or marijuana, we risk that patients will interpret that as um, okay and that ongoing and increasing use with worsening consequences could ensue. And if we just don't ask about it because it makes us uncomfortable, we might implicitly communicate that substance use disorders are unimportant and that they don't matter as much after transplant. Speaking of tension, there is a lot of tension between being stewards of organs uh, in our community and advocating for patients, especially especially psychiatric and substance use disorder patients. And I think we need to own that there's a lot of tension here too. So just taking marijuana as an example for everybody, and of course we all know what this is, these are the UNOS regions. And I just wanted you to kind of compare the legality of marijuana and see, for example, in region eight here, look at Nebraska and while they've de decriminalized marijuana, it's not you know, legal, it's prohibited in terms of all of its use, but look, it's right next to, to Colorado, you know, also in UNOS 8, and how complicated this would be from a transplant perspective. I think it's important to, to understand and just own the fact that this is heterogeneous. We don't understand how to kind of unify this clinically from a policy perspective and uh, from a social uh, perspective, and this is ongoing. To just depict this, this was a survey of 100 UNOS accredited programs, 49 responded, 
at least two from all of the regions. Look how different this is. These are just various substance use disorder parameters. For example, who requires six-month alcohol abstinence? Well, 41 percent. How about are we using validated instruments to determine substance use disorder risk of relapse? That's pretty different. How about excluding recreational marijuana use? 72 percent. Who excludes methadone use? I mean, think about Dr. Christensen's statement there, over half. So not only do you see that this may not be in line with the addiction literature, but look how different this is just between programs and um, potentially even across uh, organ teams. So if we just turn our gaze to the you know, most important part of this equation, which is, of course, the patients, um, we'll kind of tiptoe through, tip through some epidemiology here. So alcohol is a massive problem. It's impossible to overstate this. One in 20 deaths on planet Earth are alcohol-related. Alcohol use disorder rates are rising. They're affecting younger people. Alcohol-related liver disease causes half of all liver deaths. Uh, AUD and ALD, which are the same pathophysiology for us in, in, in transplant community, are severely undertreated. Uh, the medication access rates that you know, Dr. Christensen was mentioning for opioid use disorder, we also use naltrexone for alcohol use disorder, these access rates are less than 10%. We have so much room to go in terms of extending meaningful therapy. Um, hepatitis C rates are plummeting, of course, due to our um, highly effective antiviral medications, making alcohol-related liver disease the number one reason for liver death and liver disease burden and, what, and is now the number one indication for transplant, huge psychiatric comorbidity, comorbidity in this population. And unfortunately, as Dr. Christensen said about with opioids, people do drink after a liver transplant and do smoke tobacco and use marijuana after a liver transplant. And as we've talked about, transplant does not encourage people to, to talk about this. It incentivizes concealment. We all have survival instincts. People want to live. They want to be with their families. And if talking about their addiction makes that harder, they're prone to conceal. There are huge gaps in care and treatment access rates, as we've said, remain low. So who, uh, and I have to say that most of the literature is from liver, so that's the reason kind of why we're focusing there in, in, in terms of um, alcohol relapse. It's hard to predict who's gonna drink. The six month rule, there is not a lot of good data that that period of time is really worth anything from a statistical standpoint. But we know the longer people are sober intuitively, that they, they have a greater chance of remaining sober. So um, Dr. Du, Dr. Du, Mary Amanda Du, and Dr. Martini have been, you know, uh, the, the, the main people researching this, of course. And who is it that, that drinks? Well, about five, six cases per 100 patients per year um, will drink after a liver transplant. So that's about 50% of people by 10 years having had some alcohol. And in terms of heavy use that risks the health of their graft and their mortality, it's about 25% by 10 years. 40% um, of people who drink will binge within the first uh, six months of, the, of their first drink, meaning that first drink is very, very important because it rapidly escalates back to damaging and risky patterns of use. And people who drink quickly after a liver transplant, we know they are likely to have chronic and sustained use thereafter. And what does it do to the graft? Well, fat deposition, laying down of scar, and mortality become much more likely. How about survival? Well, here's two curves. The dotted line is alcohol-related liver disease, and uh, these are other liver diagnoses. And you can see that survival, which is on this axis and years after the liver transplant here, um, they're actually you know, uh, comparable and shows us that we should be transplanting alcohol-related liver disease. But as, and, and if you look at how, if people drink or not, the gray line here that's kind of hiding is abstinent. And this is, again, still survival years after liver transplant. Look at, what, look at how they separate if somebody has resumed any drinking. And then I love this study because the severity of the drinking is even parsed out from this curve, this curve, and this curve. And you can see that this is obviously the highest level of drinking and how different an abstinent patient and a severely drinking patient are in terms of survival. So these things matter from hard medical outcomes that all transplant centers really care about. Um, pivoting quickly to marijuana, it's a legal mess as we've talked about it. There is huge variability within single transplant centers across the teams, of course across the providers and between transplant centers, prone to stigma. And um, we don't really know what marijuana does, especially with immunosuppressant medications and all the other um, medications that are required uh, perioperatively. Um, we don't, the data and the science are lagging, and 
the reliability of the quality and purity and content of marijuana and cannabidiol products are suspect. So here's some recent data from 2018, 585 listed patients for liver transplant over two years. 48 had uh, some marijuana use, of course, most of it prior, some of it recent. Marijuana was associated with alcohol-related liver disease and hepatitis C and smoking and some other substance use disorder variables, but it wasn't associated with the probability of liver transplant and any weightless mortality or any delisting. So more benign in terms of the data we have. This is Michigan data. And this is, uh, to cut to the quick, there's really no effect on post-transplant survival, uh, but obviously intuitively, the older the patients are, the higher their meld if they had hepatitis C, and if they actually were transplanted, these are covariates highly uh, influential in terms of um, mortality. So you'll, you'll hear about this, and I think this is a reasonable, though rare, um, uh, clinical consideration about pulmonary aspergillosis in immunocompromised patients from fungal spores on the product that they uh, smoke. Um, cannabinoids themselves, the CB2 receptor, exists in the, uh, immuno, uh, the immunological system, and so they do have immunosuppressant properties complicating uh, the immune system in a transplant recipient. And there are a few cases here, and they're cited down here, uh, about tacrolimus levels, both from THC as well as cannabidiol that have skyrocketed with significant consequences, ICU admissions and seizure activity, mental, altered mental status in uh, post-transplant patients. In terms of opioids, um, a quick tour through the data here. So this is survival here, and, and um, the colors depict higher levels of daily morphine equivalents. And we know, and this is post-transplant um, survival, so we know that the higher um, opioid burden that patients have before uh, transplant can potentially complicate uh, their mortality afterwards. And here's all-cause graft failure that kind of shows a similar uh, relationship with higher levels of morphine equivalents constituting more risk. Over here, um, these are adjusted hazard ratios. And again, same levels of morphine equivalents. And what this shows us here is depending how much more likely are you to pass away between these different time periods? And you can see that it's different one year post-op versus one year to five years. Um, but consistently you see that these higher levels of opioid use can uh, be concerning for post-transplant outcomes. Same idea here. Uh, first year post-op is a kind of a different animal as I think we all kind of understand, but when patients get back to their life and potentially exposed to new and chronic opioid regimens, uh, the plot thickens in terms of um, graft loss and mortality. So I think it, it, this should motivate us to really scrutinize how much um, opioids people are using uh, when we meet them as candidates. I think Dr. Christensen did be a better job of this than me. I don't think that there's anything new here. I would just really highlight this. Transplant is not the time to taper, but this is really, we're dealing with uh, issues right now in our hospital about Suboxone and methadone in, in patients who are otherwise reasonable candidates, and it's very, very tough sledding in terms of making those uh, decisions. Um, so how about tobacco? Again, pretty variable, which I think is uh, a theme that you're detecting here. Intuitively, uh, in cancer, or I'm sorry, in uh, transplant recipients, the risk of cancer and of infection and clots, as well as uh, vascular health, all of these things are more complicated in patients who return to smoking. And for our um, alcohol-related liver disease patients and otherwise our alcohol use disorder patients throughout the transplant community, uh, pre-transplant tobacco smoking may correlate with post-transplant drinking. And so I think for various reasons, I think we should be screening patients and talking to them about any resumption of um, smoking. About 3% of kidney recipients annually are smoking, more likely to be young folks with substance use disorders and medical comorbidities. That, that kind of prevalence, the cross-section goes up when it comes to an addicted population. And there's new data that uh, just came out, that Weinberger citation at the bottom there, that shows that marijuana smoking actually may correlate uh, with uh, tobacco use in the form of new incident smoking, as well as smoking relapse and decreased likelihood of smoking cessation. So we're seeing how these things intersect uh, in terms of different substances in different patients, different patient populations. And remember those two big arrows that I showed before about how 
there's always that tension between reducing patients down and synthesizing uh, them back up, and I think this shows why we have to do that. In terms of illicit, so this kind of denotes things like methamphetamine or cocaine um, that are, you know, uh, PCP or hallucinogens. Um, we don't know a lot about this, uh, to be honest. Um, we, we all kind of uh, screen for it and ask about it, and we don't transplant people who are using it. Of course, depending on what team we work on, you know, liver teams will see it more than kidney teams will. Um, but there are a few studies about post-transplant non-alcohol use disorder substance use. And so we think that it's rare, um, and we know that you know, liver transplant recipients who did have this polysubstance use uh, component to them uh, may have higher rates of personality disorders, lower rates of housing, poor work history, lower levels of social support, and may in fact relapse um, substantially more, when you think about it, uh, than their kind of more monolithic alcohol use disorder counterparts. And I think I'll end there. Wow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Winder, and thank you, Dr. Christensen, for such an informative presentation. I know I personally just learned a lot. Um, but in just a moment here, I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, um, Leanne Swanson, who's going to facilitate our Q&A session. Um, but before I do so, I would just like to remind everyone that if you do have any questions for either of our presenters, please be sure to submit them using that chat feature. Again, that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. You'll see the blue um, chat box button, and you can go ahead and click that to type your questions. Also, um, during our Q&A session, I'll have this poll up. So for those of you who are listening in a group, we just ask that you complete this poll and let us know how many people are actually participating in your group. Um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our, uh, Leanne. Thank you so much. Thanks, Deanna, and thank you, Dr. Christensen and Dr. Winder. Uh, we have a couple questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and get started. Mabel has a question. Can you use naltrexone on liver transplant patients, patients, or what is the best therapy to use on these patients, just methadone? So um, for somebody with severely impaired liver function, the best medication is probably methadone followed by buprenorphine, and I believe a lot of clinicians are still concerned about using uh, naltrexone on a regular basis in someone with severely impaired function. I think um, Mabel has a good, uh, she's at, at our center and, and, and she's asking a good question, I think for good reasons. In terms of opioid use disorder, I agree um, with Dr. Christensen. I think for alcohol use disorder, now, Trexone, uh, the, the literature behind it suggests that it might be helpful, more helpful for patients who cannot maintain sobriety or who are burdened by um, relapsing illness rather than people who simply have cravings and have been able to put together some prolonged sobriety. So I think there's not good data in liver failure with naltrexone used um, for alcohol use disorder, but I think this is a, a cost-benefit ratio and calculation uh, between teams who have to weigh the, the hepatic risk of ongoing drinking with the hepatic risk of using naltrexone. And I think the best thing to do is to stay close to hepatology and to have very integrated and collaborative care around these patients because we've, we have clinical experience of using naltrexone successfully in liver failure patients, in liver transplant patients, um, but the jury's still out about the hard data. All right, thank you. And can you explain the difference between marijuana, uh, THC, and CBC? So, so um, uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Christensen. Uh, marijuana typically has two different drugs in it, THC, which is the one that is euphoric uh, and is considered to be um, still a uh, highly controlled substance. CBD is really probably an anti-inflammatory and an anti-epileptic, which was downgraded to a Schedule V controlled substance and is really considered, in, in my state anyway, is considered to be EMP. It has no euphoric properties, and it's the drug you may have heard about for childhood epilepsy. All right, thank you. Another question, for potential transplant candidates, how are you measuring severity and what tools are you using? 
I'll give that one to Dr. Winder. Sure, sure. So we, we're using a variety of psychometric instruments. Um, I think like a lot of um, transplant centers, we're using Dr. Shares and Dr. Maldonado's um, Stanford Integrated Psychosocial Assessment for Transplant, which is a um, clinician rating scale over four domains of a patient's um, psychosocial profile, and a full quarter of that, of course, is um, addiction related. Um, in um, the transplant psychiatry program at Michigan, we also track um, depression and anxiety and insomnia um, scores, uh, given their obvious relevance to substance use disorders. And um, we apply uh, DSM-5 criteria that I showed you uh, to, to each candidate that's evaluated by transplant psychiatry or transplant psychology to try and quantify how bad this is. Uh, we also use the audit uh, uh, for um, alcohol use disorder uh, inventory, as well as the DAST, the, the drug, abuse, drug abuse screening test. And so every patient that's seen in our transplant psychiatry program gets these measures and we track them religiously for patients that return to our clinic, all trying to gauge how comorbid they are with psychiatry and addiction pathology and how severe they are, all the while trying to anticipate how we can best get them to transplant if that's the appropriate thing and keep them well afterwards. The brief addiction monitor is another uh, medicine that's built for kind of queries uh, over time and could also be used by transplant centers to track uh, severity. Thank you. Heidi has another question. At their center for heart transplant, they say three to six months of abstinence or a negative tox screen. Is there really any point in advising three months? Do you, what do you suggest? Well, that, the three months is, and by DSM criteria, is early remission. I, Again, the alcohol literature that I reviewed suggests that that predicts problems afterwards. Um, I don't know of anything dealing with opioids and saying that with length of abstinence and post-transplant outcomes. Yeah, Heidi, I think these are the types of questions we really grapple with. And we all know that there are patients who've been sober longer than six months who really don't have any business being transplanted because they're not in recovery. We also know that there are people who have been sober less than six months or around three months who have excellent uh, prognosis. I think the key here is we have to have multidisciplinary care. You know, social work, psychology, psychiatry need to all be together with good um, data, good relationships that we can vet these variables together and make good clinical decisions. I don't think there's any way around that. We all touch these patients, interact with these patients, in different ways, we've got to get together and really work hard on refining what criteria we use because the literature is all over the place and never really hold ourselves to any particular time period. We, there is no literature between any month's abstinence. What we know that the, the, more that the more months people have put together for sobriety, that that as a function of time does predict abstinence post-transplant. So it's, it's a big calculation that we've all got to um, work together on. All right. And Rebecca has a question. What are your thoughts on PES testing? Is it reliable? I'm so um, we use PES testing a lot with uh, our health monitoring program, and every test has a different window. So the breathalyzer is good for hours. The ETG test is good for days. And the PEF test is good for weeks and sometimes months. Um, and in monitoring programs, the PEF test is the most likely test to show up positive, no matter what your, quote, drug of choice is, unquote. Um, and uh, it has fewer false positives than the ETG test, but it's not uh, responsive because you may be positive for weeks after you stop drinking. Yeah, uh, I think I, I, I totally agree. Uh, in transplant, uh, so what PEF is is phosphatidyl ethanol. So it's a, a lipid species that's uh, formed by uh, the red blood cells. And it, it's on, it only forms when there's ethanol in the bloodstream. So what Dr. Christensen said is absolutely right. It's very sensitive, very specific. Um, and so in the addiction community, sometimes they don't use it as much because 
uh, you know, a patient could have new sobriety that, you know, the PEP doesn't really help with. In transplant, I think it's invaluable because invariably we're all looking for some sort of relapse or some sort of abstinence. It becomes black and white. In terms of its reliability, I, I think it's very, this is a very, very important point. No one uh, lab value ever means more than its one lab value. And it doesn't mean that it's not a substance use disorder diagnosis. We shouldn't infer more than that. We must bring the patient in and evaluate them. Um, so do we use PETH? Absolutely. We generate them all the time. Um, PETH will miss proximal drinking. So a patient could drink before, the night before the transplant evaluation, which as we know patients unfortunately do, and the PETH will be negative. Um, so we use ethylglucuronide at the point of contact as well because that's more sensitive to recent drinking, though its value, that what you get back in terms of the level of the metabolite is less helpful. But yes, we use PETH all the time and find it very, very helpful. Great, thank you. Erin has a question, is there any correlation between relapse and compliance with immunosuppressant drugs? I'll pass. Uh, <laughs> do you want to take this one, Dr. Christensen? No, sir, you. <laughs> so, I, Aaron, I can't cite the um, – so it's about a third of patients um, per year um, that any provider sees will have some level of um, immunosuppressant uh, non-adherence. There's a paper, I didn't have time to present it, from Mary Amanda Dew from the 2000s that she talks about that. I can't cite you the data off the top of my head about what um, contribution statistically substance use disorders have to that, but I think clinically we all know uh, that based on the various substances of abuse, they would exert um, unfavorable influences on the patient's lifestyle, self-care, adherence, not to mention the pharmacologic complexity that they have. So I think clinically that there is, um, and I think we all kind of intuitively know that, and I think that is the reason why we have to be so vigilant with toxicology and nuanced clinical evaluations before and after transplant to try and catch it. Great, thank you. Heidi has another question, um, sort of I guess an example. Age 20 patient, urgent listing, no time for abstinence. Would you transplant or not transplant? Crystal meth. The patient's on crystal uh, meth, no abstinence. Yeah, so Heidi, these are, there's a lot of variables here uh, in, in a heart patient, she says, too. So, yeah. um, it's, it, it would be inappropriate for me to just sort of fire off a verdict because I don't want to get in, you know, put the cart before the horse, as it were. But this is the reason why liver transplant is so um, concerned about acute alcohol-related hepatitis because it is this question. What happens when people come in, they're imminently sick, and in the case of certainly acute alcohol-related hepatitis, they are altered, they're encephalopathic, so you can't talk to them. And I guess I, I sound like a broken record, but this is the reason why we have to understand these patients psychosocially. That's why I think we should um, have good, strong teams who can collaborate. We use psychometric instruments. We seek collateral data. And we make good clinical judgment. I just don't think there's going to be any quick algorithm. There's not going to be a biomarker. There's not going to be any new technology that's going to be able to surpass or supplant good psychosocial clinicians with good experience, who stay close to the literature and make good, consistent decisions with good inter-rater reliability. So do I, I think there are patients, Heidi, who come into the hospital who are acutely sick, who don't have any sober time, who should be transplanted. Are they the majority? Absolutely not. Are, the, are they the minority? Of course. Um, do we have to be very, very careful? Absolutely. But I think it's possible. It's just going to be rare. Thank you so much. I think we are at the top of the hour, and I'm not seeing any more questions in the queue. So with that, um, I want to thank Dr. Christensen and Dr. Winder again for an excellent presentation, and thank you all so much for your questions. Obviously, this is a hot topic and one that you know will continue on, but really appreciate you sharing your expertise and insight. And thank you all so much again for joining us for this month's transplant webinar, and we look forward to 
um, you joining us next month and wish you all a good rest of your day.